in to see you, not me. <laughs> I'm surprised you're okay. using this camera on your desktop. Why aren't you using this camera? Oh, I, I don't have it plugged in, but oh, I'm not, okay. not going to use a camera because I'm going to use my screen. So oh. I want to share a screen. I want it to screen right here. Okay. There you go. Okay. Are you put your headphones on, or how are you going to talk to people? Yep, uh, my headphones on. Okay. Says. Okay. I'm devastating. Do you have any questions? Yeah, and a good morning. I'm going to dial in. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Well, that, that's very encouraging. Good. <laughs> We're having technology actually work. That's pretty exciting. So, Annette. Are you gonna are you gonna be checking as to I'm sorry, what? Are you gonna be checking as to how many people are are signed in? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is Jeff speaking. So I, I'm going to ask uh, those of you that are online if you could mute your, your, your line so that we don't have multiple conversations going on simultaneously. So if you could uh, press the mute button on your, on your computers, that would be desired. And I will welcome all of you to something that we've never done before. <laughs> this is a this is an end of one experience for us, uh, a follow up from one of our TLC the, the Thought Leader con, uh, Consortium meetings to really talk through some of the things after a couple of weeks post meeting that might be interesting to reflect upon. So if if all of you who are are connected could mute your lines, please, um, so that we don't get a lot of interference because we might have several people obviously involved so and I will uh, I'll move ahead and uh, and thank those of you who have given over some of your time to be involved with this this is a, a kind of a new experiment so as I reflect back on our uh, extraordinary time that we spent together in in Seattle on the 11th 12th of uh, October uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, pleased as to the outcome of the meeting, both in terms of what we learned from the uh, key opinion leaders that shared their ideas with us, and also uh, with the conversations that went on among uh, the attendees. You know, we had uh, we had nearly 400 attendees, and so it was for us a really important uh, kind of opportunity uh, to get multiple opinions, multiple conversations, and to uh, see what people really think about this thing of uh, personalized uh, nutrition and, and where this, this field may be going. So let me give you some statistics that I thought are interesting. Uh, when I looked at the number of uh, new companies that have 
come into this space that are now involved in some way in personalized nutrition versus kind of general nutrition uh, concepts. I could count more than 30 companies and more than uh, $2 billion of investment capital over the last couple of years that have gone into this field. So it was quite amazing to me to actually see how this, uh, this revolution is starting to emerge. And, you know, as I go back to the initiation of when we started uh, PLMI uh, six or seven years ago, and we were kind of like a, just a, a voice in the wilderness as it relates to personalized lifestyle healthcare, I can see now that uh, we were not far away from uh, the reality of how this is actually occurring. It's actually becoming something real and actually going to uh, the indexed uh, publications in the world. We see more and more people using this term of, of both personalized uh, nutrition and personalized um, healthcare. So it's uh, and, and personalized nutrition. So I, I think that we're really uh, witnessing a transformation. Now, what did we take away from this that's, that's news to use? And I, I think that's a very interesting question. And, and I'd like to give some thoughts, at least my perspective on, on what maybe some of the takeaways were from, the, from this meeting. I think, first of all, uh, not too far before we had the meeting, there was this uh, really interesting article that appeared in, uh, in JAMA that was uh, authored by Linda Van Horn and, and Marilyn Cornelis that um, I thought was extraordinarily provocative and certainly consistent with the theme of what we were trying to get across at this, uh, this, this Thought Leaders Consortium. And, and on your screen, if you're following my slides, um, it was, this article was entitled, uh, United States Dietary Guide, Guidance, Is It Working? And in this article, the, uh, the authors started off saying, uh, you know, what's going on over the last uh, 20 or 30 years as it relates to community-based uh, nutrition, education, nutrition information. And so they went through a lot of the public health things that are being done and the advocacy for changing the diets and, and the you know, dietary recommendations that have come from guidance uh, policy-making bodies. And uh, so they, they went through this fairly long laundry list of, um, of imperatives and things that have been done, initiatives uh, costing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then they ask the question, has it really moved the needle? So do we say that it's really leading to substantive changes in the way people eat and the way that they uh, use nutrition as a, a part of their health program? And the answer to that was uh, no. <laughs> if you really uh, examine the metrics of uh, whether we're moving the needle and improving health outcomes by this public health, uh, community-based, population-based messaging, the answer is no. Well, by the way, I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback, so would you please all check your, make sure you're muted, and your speakers are turned off. And if you could all check right now, because I don't think anyone wants to hear other people's. Good, thank you. Um, so when I looked at this article in, in uh, JAMA, there is a very interesting quote uh, that kind of characterizes the article and it actually supports the whole focus of the uh, TLC this year, the uh, personalizing of nutrition. And, I, and I'm quoting, you're probably reading it on your screen. Uh, the application of advanced biomarker discovery technology and the knowledge of genetic and gut microbiota differences in response to diet offer promising new strategies towards optimizing nutrition research and leveraging existing resources. And I think this next sentence is, is really one of the key sentences in this uh, editorial. These methods, the authors want to say, encourage enthusiasm for personalized or precision nutrition in contrast with the current population-based model that provides non-specific healthy eating advice. With continued investment in precision nutrition and companion precision medicine more broadly, future dietary guidelines might incorporate a similar approach, perhaps extending age-specific guidelines to other subgroups defined by certain biological factors. And I think that's an extraordinarily important last two words in this, uh, this quote, because when we talk about biological factors, what we're really talking about is personalizing nutrition based upon the individual characteristics of that person and how that's done is based on, by the way, I don't think you all have your, if you could all please check your mute. Could you check your mute please? because we're getting feedback. Thank you. So um, 
this this construct is is getting more uh, sticky and and it's really moving from kind of this this community based uh, nutrition that we all learned and, and studied and and, and built a whole formalism around to this new age of uh, uh, that really, uh, as Roger Williams said back in the 70s, nutrition is for real people. Statistical humans are of little interest. And so how do we really start to empower uh, this uh, this kind of nutrition as a implemental strategy, implementable strategy? So that then leads to this uh, really interesting paper by Ruth uh, Lois uh, that appeared recently in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Uh, entitled from nutrigenomics to personalizing diet so we're ready for precision medicine and um, it, it goes back to ask the question uh, is the answer to all these questions related to uh, genetic analysis to genomic screening uh, to single SNP analysis single nucleotide polymorphism and I think what we have learned and certainly was brought up very nicely in our TLC meeting is that you really can't do this one snip at a time. You've got to look at this as, as groups of, of um, uniqueness in the, in the genomic profile that uh, all tie together or relate to specific types of functional characteristics of the individual but tied to nutrition uh, status. And I could not have thought of a better way of developing that than uh, Albert Laszlo Garabasi's presentation. Uh, those of you that were, were there for his first of the morning introductory presentation on network medicine and network uh, nutrition, I think were gifted with a real. I'm still getting a lot of feedback, guys. Come on now, please. At the end. Would you please look at your mute and make sure you click on the mute? All of you do this because we have, you know, several hundred people that are going to be listening. We don't need the background noise. So uh, Barabasi's talk was was extraordinary, and I, I I think those of you that have had a chance to maybe glance at his book um, Network Medicine, uh, you see the brilliance of that group and and the collaborators he has at, at Harvard and elsewhere, including the work that's that's ongoing really in this whole network biology systems biology area is really giving the, the weight and the gravitas and the formalism. Can you change how to dangle the Yeah. Don't throw on the slides. That's, that's awesome. So uh, we're getting a little bit of uh, Cantonese uh, expression there. So someone, I have a suspicion in the, our Chinese group is not muted. So if you can make sure you're all muted, I'd appreciate it. Dr. Bland, is there, is, there a, is there a possible way you could mute on your end and, and cancel everyone else out? I think we're, we're, really? looking, we're looking right now as to how we might do that. <laughs> I, I, I emailed it to you. Oh, so the link, everything is on there. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're Have looking. a great weekend, guys. Appreciate a great week. <laughs> we're trying to find a way that we could mute, mute everyone other than me here for the, the time period. There may there may be Jeff. A, yes please Jeff, this mm -hmm. is this is Amy. Hi, if, Amy. Um, if if good morning if Annette goes I think it's maybe Annette uh, the host whoever the mm -hmm. host is if they open up the participant list they'll be able to see so, whose mic is Jeff the one that. that's catching oh, it up. Live, live oh okay. Nice. And so, then they can mute it. Have a good weekend. Eh? Yeah. Go to the participant list, Annette. Amy is telling us and find who's not muted and then you can personally mute them. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of people that aren't muted. Oh, hold it just a minute. I see. Here we go. I just, I just muted all of them. Right. Oh, did you mute all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll good. Muted. Try try yes. No, no, yes. It's saying allow them to. Oh, okay. Oh, now I think we're muted. They're all muted. Oh, good. I think we did it. Thank you for your help. It shows you how we're very naive about how to manage Skype, but we're learning here. Uh, so let me let me continue on. Thank you so much. So I, I think we'll pass over this this uh, Ruth Luce uh, paper that really says that we should be looking at uh, when we're talking about genomic profiling about patterns that tie themselves back and connect those genes into lifestyle, diet, and environmental factors, and this. This basically is part of kind of my stalking grounds or stumping grounds, as you probably know, because I think we've used genetics to always tie to disease risk. 
it's a very negative messaging that we've used when really, if we think of this in a broader sense, it's not that our genes are there to be disease risk genes, they're there to be functional genes to create how we individually respond to environmental messaging. And so if you recast the definition of how we're using genetics uh, to evaluate individualization into patterns that define specific metabolic archetypes and uh, different ways that we individually process. And let me give you an example, uh, one that did come up in our, in our meeting that I think is a classic example, and that's uh, starch metabolism. So now we see that there are a whole series of papers that have been published over the last uh, several months that look at the amylase, the enzyme, as you know, that uh, code that is involved with starch digestion, uh, amylase uh, activity differences among individuals that have something to do with how different people manage carbohydrate, starch. And it has to do with not only the SNPs of, of the amylase encoding gene, uh, but it also has to do with the copy number of the number of genes that code for amylase. We often, you know, I think make this, this uh, assumption that when we have a specific genetic characteristic that's coded on just or carried on just one gene, but actually that gene can be, as you know, in multiple copies so that uh, the copy number of those genes may influence how abundant the uh, expression of that characteristic is into the phenotype of the individual. And these studies that have been published over the last year uh, have clearly shown that individuals who have differing numbers of different copy numbers of the amylase gene have different uh, ways in which they manage carbohydrate. And you can correlate things like carbohydrate uh, sensitive obesity with copy number. And so uh, these are different ways I think that are emerging to use that information from uh, the genomic analysis to start assessing uh, personalized nutrition uh, uniqueness. And I'm not gonna say uh, uh, risk, I'm gonna talk about uniqueness because all these characteristics are really defining how we might, from a, from a genetic selection basis, respond to unique uh, dietary uh, characteristics and or dietary composition. And I think this is um, an extraordinary frame shifting concept because it is my belief that up until recently, our genes were all considered to be kind of risk profiling information. <laughs> and, and when you get into that area of risk profiling, not only is it a negative bit of information that most people don't like to hang out with, but secondly, it doesn't really relate very closely to how to shape a, uh, a, and personalize nutrition based upon just using risk reduction parameters, knowing that these single alleles don't match very closely with phenotypic characteristics of the individual that are a complex array of multiple genes being expressed as families that control specific metabolic characteristics. So I think our, our um, PLC meeting did a really good job, thanks to uh, the, the foundation that Barabasi laid down, to start looking much more broadly at how this, uh, this nutrition information can be used clinically for assessing and understanding uh, individual nutrition needs. Now with, with that, then it, uh, it obviously ties together with the, this, this paradigm shifting concept, which I think we've crossed uh, the threshold now and we're, we're not gonna go back over the threshold. I think this is a one-way street in, in looking at how genes and environment interplay to give rise to what we see as our, as our phenotype. And if there's any one thing that I would say is a aha for us all as it relates to the evolution of our field, um, it would be this uh, increasing understanding of the interface between how our genetic uniqueness interplays with our environment, our lifestyle, our diet, our stress, our and, and toxins in our environment, all um, the circadian rhythms, all these various factors, which we previously thought were important, but we didn't have a formalism as to how they actually would weave themselves into individuals' response that give rise to how they look, act, and feel. And, and this, this is changing dramatically rapidly. I mean, the doubling time of information in this field now, uh, I used to say it was three years, but uh, I've heard recently in a, in a meeting I went to at Stanford that it's probably more like uh, one and a half years doubling time in this area. So it means every one and a half to two years, we accrue as much new information about this area of gene environment interaction and the relationship to our phenotype than has been accumulated from time memoriam on until 
that time. So it's a, it's a hugely dynamic uh, period of, of information accrual. And this uh, particular article uh, that again appeared in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, this uh, gene environment interplay article, I think um, really kind of summarized everything that I was trying to say and probably in very succinctly and, and that the genes that have been identified as groups of genes that play roles in fundamental processes that relate to how people respond to their diet, including lipolysis or the breakdown of, of fats and the kinds of fats, be it uh, polyunsaturated fats, omega-6 or omega-3s, or saturated or medium chain triglycerides or long chain uh, fatty acids. So those characteristics are encoded within a families of genes that are involved with, with uh, lipolytic activity. Thermogenesis is another one. So, you know, why does certain uh, uh, beige fat brown under certain dietary considerations? And, and, and what are the unique characteristics uh, uh, that relate to things like UCP1, uh, uncoupling protein 1 genetics that controls in mitochondrial um, thermogenesis and, uh, and, and is seen in these, uh, these browning uh, tissues that we used to think were just gone, only found in infants, but now we actually find these, uh, uh, these beige tissues that are distributed throughout the, the body, including the liver, that can become brown under a certain set of conditions. Browning, the reason they are brown, obviously, is because they upregulate the production of these iron-containing uh, cytochromes that are involved with uh, oxidative phosphorylation and, and um, energy production and, and uh, production of heat in the thermogenic response. So when a tissue browns, and by the way, in rodents, you can see this very easily. It's uh, very interesting. If you put rodents in, in very cold conditions, uh, this has been done in the nude mouse where you can actually look through the skin uh, of these mice, you can actually see the subcutaneous fat browning uh, in, in because you've, it's turned on uh, through this uh, thermogenic process that's mediated through hypothalamic hormones. It turns on the ability for the genes that produce heat from uh, food energy to uh, be activated. So we're now starting to see that different people have different thermogenic potentials and how this relates to thrifty genotypes or not so thrifty genotypes to use a Robert Neal concept as to whether people are more likely to store calories for a rainy day that never comes or to be using it uh, rapidly as a, as a source of energy, even this fugitive energy that we call heat. That's the ultimate end product of, uh, of degradation of, cal of, of food energy into, uh, into calories that we expend to the universe. And then the genes that control glucose tolerance and, and detoxification. And I mean, I could go down the list of these, these metabolic clusters of, of families of genes that regulate certain responses that we have individually to our diet and our environment. So th this is really where the action play is. And I think uh, we started to learn about this um, uh, from the experts that were sharing their information with us at the, uh, the TLC. Uh, one example is this, uh, uh, the genes of the ARDC3 uh, DC family, which uh, are playing roles in the regulation of cell surface uh, uh, receptors that are part of the G-coupled protein receptor family that responds then to specific dietary signals and, and certain hormones like the adrenergic hormones that then turns on specific uh, metabolic pathways. So uh, as, as I'm trying to use as examples, we're, we're, dig we're digging deeper now into the understanding of how you take genetic information and translate it into a mechanistic understanding of how that person's diet may specifically influence their uh, phenotype, their outcome uh, in terms of function. And these, as this article said in the American Journal uh, of Clinical Nutrition, these results can leverage then what we get from genetic expression analyses that provide uh, early biological footprints uh, of how an unhealthy diet and environment for the individual could influence their, their, their functional health. And all of this weighs really on uh, what was nicely described in this recent art, uh, issue of Science Magazine in which the, um, the whole focus of the articles in the special issue was on this genotype to phenotype connection. Um, and as I've said, we're a food-based culture, but our physiology is determined by nutrients whose need is determined by the gene genotype of the individual. And therefore, food represents a delivery system for the nutrients that modulate an individual's phenotype. That's the field that we call nutrigenomics. So uh, we're starting to flesh out this definition with much more granularity and much more precision, I believe, uh, going from the early days of, of nutrigenomics, which was aspirational, to now the, 
the more advanced or more uh, evolving maturity of this concept, which is to really look at how food uh, provides signals, the composition of food provides signals that modulate then aspects of genetic expression, epigenetic regulation, and, and ultimately translation uh, into the phenotype. So this is a, this is a revolutionary uh, kind of transition in thinking that's, uh, that's leaving behind, I believe, the old community-based, population-based nutrition which still plays a role. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we're looking at, at gross kinds of things within a culture, like a, a, a population-based uh, epidemiological assessment, this, still, this, this information that we've accrued from uh, population community studies is still useful. But if we're down to individual nutritional counseling and individual recommendations, th that we're seeing that the extrapolation from a community-based, uh, population-based model into the individual is a pretty poor translation. It's a little bit like the fallacy of translating single SNPs into an individual's health uh, or looking at GWAS data, the uh, genome-wide association studies uh, that seen a certain SNP is associated with a disease. But then when we look at the individual, we find that often that that doesn't penetrate into the individual. It might on a community-based statistical basis, but not in the individual. So you'll notice we're moving generally from this kind of broad brush uh, model that was really the foundation of what we learned in medicine and nutrition was population based to a new model that that's, uh, it is more complex, but it's also much more precise because we're moving to the to the individual uh, as being where the action point lies. And in fact, in that, um, that issue of Science Magazine that I just described, there's this really nice uh, uh, diagram which I think uh, is, is a good summary of a lot of stuff. You can think of many, many uh, papers and many concepts that are, that are summarized under this. This is uh, the concept of translating uh, genomics and precision medicine moving from the lab to the clinic. And if you just go around this interesting circle uh, of, of individual relative risk, you'll notice that uh, the reason I put a red circle here uh, around this is this biomarker biometrics component which then incorporates early tailored intervention and prevention. To me, the word prognosis becomes really, really important as we're talking about personalized nutrition. What we're trying to move away from is this lower quadrant over here, this lower section uh, at the seven o'clock in the diagram, which is uh, diagnosis. Diagnosis is late stage, and that's where medicine has been uh, and still needs to be, uh, is in diagnosing and and treating uh, acute uh, disease. But what we'd like to be moving for, toward is more prognosis. And, and often what I find is people are using the term diagnosis in our field when they really should be using the term prognosis because the things that we're most interested in knowing about as it relates to personalized nutrition is what is the prognosis of that patient uh, in terms of the state of their uh, genotype phenotype conversion not just the diagnosis. Diagnosis is a little bit like uh, uh, what we do with a uh, auditing of our financial statement, uh, looking at it post hoc versus prognosis. It's more looking like a balance sheet or an income statement of a company as to where we're going. And I think that this term pro prognosis um, and this early tailored intervention really relates to me how we measure function. And so I think here is where function comes again as a, as a potentially important marker. What is the function that that person has as it relates to how they would metabolize fats or carbohydrates or, or uh, proteins or how do specific vitamins and minerals or accessory nutrients play roles in their function unique to their own uh, personal um, genetic and epigenetic uh, profile. And Vera Abbasi, of course, was the guy who originally got us kind of thinking of this kind of layers of understanding of, uh, of interaction of networks. Uh, you recall this article that appeared back in, uh, I can't believe it, it was 19, it was 2007. It's hard to believe that that was 12 years ago when this uh, was first seen in JAMA, in New England Journal of Medicine. But uh, this was really getting us to think about networks, this, the genomic network that's tied to the metabolic network that's tied to this disease zone that's tied to social networks because we tend to hang out in cultures that reinforce specific patterns of behavior that are associated with specific diseases that are associated with specific metabolic networks and regulatory controls that are regulated by specific genotypes. So all of these things are, you know, kind of layers of uh, uh, interaction that as we're doing evaluation, um, 
and we're trying to figure out nutritional status, we'd want to take all of these into account. Uh, the prognosis, the social matrix that that person finds himself in, uh, in herself or himself, and the, 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 the metabolic effects that are uh, uh, inherent as it relates to how the genes are being expressed into this network through all of these factors that associate with the environment. So this, this clearly is a different paradigm, a different approach uh, than that which most of us learned in school, which was more of a community-based, uh, uh, population-based approach. So this article that appeared in Nutrition Reviews in uh, 2018, uh, entitled Systems Biology of Personalized Nutrition, really recast what I've just said, you know, specifically looking at how diet with its complexity and the various aspects of its different signals, uh, both macro, micronutrients and phytonutrients and accessory nutrients, how these all connect into these different areas of metabolic function that we're describing through the genomic uniqueness of the individual, which then has to do with functions at the organismic level, at the organ level, which then has to do with how we respond to our diet and lifestyle. So, all these things, again, this is, a, this is a new formalism that I think we, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, specifics about at, from our uh, various presenters at the TLC. And then it, it mapped, uh, if you think back to the TLC, what, what, did, we, uh, what, what did we see? We, we saw clinical work that was being done on, um, on a variety of, of different disease states, including, uh, well, pain with uh, Robert Van Akdar and energy and fatigue related symptoms, uh, vision. We, we, we had a really great example of uh, retinopathy and the connection of these things and individual risk to uh, macular degeneration and, and how this uh, again ties genomic uniqueness to the diet, to lifestyle, to a function of an organ, in this case the eye, uh, to women's hormonal health uh, with Dr. Godstein. I mean, we're, we were starting to see actually how these constructs that I'm describing uh, really relate to and connect into uh, the functional characteristics that give rise to uh, healthcare problems that often get partitioned in the specific subspecialties of medicine, as if you know these these organs kind of <laughs> sit in isolation and work independently when we know that they they really don't. They're part of this this network biology. So I I believe that we we were able to uh, <clears throat> kind of at at the TLC look both in what I call the, <clears throat> the microscope and the telescope <clears throat> simultaneously, the microscope being more down in the grit of the uh, genomic uniqueness and the telescope meaning more the, the broad-based systems level of how these influence individuals uh, with health. And then of course, <clears throat> we, were, uh, we were blessed to go to even one other level. And that was Susan Prescott's extraordinary presentation that took health of the individual into planetary health and started to really show us <clears throat> that we are interconnected at this, this other superordinate level that takes us out of our, our, our self-focus into a much broader focus of how we interact on a planetary level in a global health uh, composition. The, the, the large cycles that would be similar to the metabolic uh, network of our bodies, the I guess you'd call it the metabolic uh, processes of our ecosystem, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus, the hyd hydrological cycles, all these things that are intimately interrelated with the Anthropocene that we're living in this, this uh, human uh, culture that's now for the first time really probably affecting global patterns of, uh, of energy flow and, and nutrition on, on, a, on a planetary level. If I could use nutrition as a kind of a a placeholder to mean how the planet is nourished. And I think that these are really powerful concepts that take us from maybe being overly focused on our individual myopia to a much bigger picture of how, how we as per people individually influence collectively the broader scale of, of nutrition. If you think of the, the organosphere as, as a cell-based model, the globe being a cell, how the cell is is nourished and how its health is, uh, is defined by the ind individual components, the organelles, which happens to be us as people living on the planet. So I, I think that this is a, was a very powerful message that Susan brought to us to make sure we don't get uh, too narcissistic here and just uh, focused in on our, our own individual health problems, but to recognize that we are all interconnected 
through these planetary systems, and it's the it's a composite of all of our individual health, healths and and uh, lifestyles that gives rise to this collective. The um, the nature of how this then all relates clinically uh, to the broader picture, um, I think, was at least explored uh, in this, uh, what I, I consider a landmark paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Many of you have heard me talk about this before. Um, <clears throat> this was a paper that uh, was published in 2014 out of the work of, uh, of Kira uh, and uh, Carizian at, at Harvard and their group in which they were asking the question, uh, <clears throat> how does genetic risk for a disease, in this case, atherosclerosis, uh, correlate with, if at all, with lifestyle uh, habits? And so they did this uh, really interesting intervention. I, I won't uh, worry by going over it in great detail because you've all heard about this, but uh, this was the, uh, the study that uh, took a, a large number of individuals from from three different um, studies that have been done and had data analysis on them. Uh, so you've, you've got the tens of thousands of people that are involved in this, um, in this data set, uh, both from uh, Europe and the United States. And then these are individuals that had genomic screens that were done on them. And so they had access to the GWAS data or the, the data that related to the, the most uh, penetrant uh, genes, SNPs of genes that were associated with uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis. And so they were able to identify these most commonly associated gene uh, SNPs that were associated with heart disease, uh, over 50 of them. And they also had uh, the ability from these data sets to uh, have evaluated their kind of gross lifestyle based upon exercise patterns, smoking patterns, alcohol, weight, uh, dietary patterns. And so they were able to score their lifestyles based on four different, you know, from uh, not so good to good. And then they were able to score their genotypes relative to cardiovascular disease risk based upon these um, family of genes that had been identified to have a high association with atherosclerosis. And they rated those also from low genetic risk to high genetic risk. And then they asked the question over time, uh, how do these people go on uh, with regard to their vascular health or vascular disease? Um, and the data set that I've shown there in, in this uh, graphic uh, shows you kind of the outcome of the study. So if you then were to score genetic risk into three different sub groups, one being low genetic risk, one being intermediate genetic risk, and one being high genetic risk. And then you correlate that with stratification to uh, various uh, categories of lifestyle, uh, favorable lifestyle, intermediately favorable and then unfavorable lifestyle. What you can see uh, from examining this, this data set is there is a very interesting interrelationship between genetic risk and lifestyle risk. And so let's look over at the far right, the, the most high genetic risk group. And then let's look at the three subcategories of the high genetic risk group, the unfavorable lifestyle in the red, the intermediary lifestyle in the green or gray, and then the favorable lifestyle in the blue. And what do you see there? Yeah, first of all, you see the error bars. It shows a very uh, statistically significant segmentation of let's say the blue, which is the favorable lifestyle, from the red, the unfavorable lifestyle, at the high genetic risk group. And the conclusion, as was shown in the summary of this paper, in the conclusions of the, of the paper, was that individuals with high genetic risk who had favorable lifestyles had a 50% lower incidence of uh, coronary calcification than, than, than did individuals who had high genetic risk and unfavorable lifestyles. Let me say it again. This is the, on the far right uh, panel of data there. The, when the individuals that had the high genetic risk based on their GWAS studies and had the unfavorable lifestyle had more than twice the genetic, uh, twice the incidence of coronary calcification as did the individuals on the same high genetic risk but had a favorable lifestyle. So, you know, a, a simple takeaway from that is, gee whiz, if we had a pill that we could give people with high genetic risk that would lower their 
risk of coronary calcification by 50%, wouldn't that be marvelous? There is no drug that can actually achieve that result. Uh, even the, uh, the new uh, kind of remarkable biologics. And, and so here is an example that would say lifestyle is a moderating factor of statistical importance in reducing the penetrance of a genetic risk into the phenotype that we call coronary calcification. And I, I think there's no probably more dramatic uh, study that I've seen that really makes this point very clear that when we are personalizing nutrition to the individual's need to put them in a favorable lifestyle diet category, that we're not taking away their genes, <laughs> we're not changing their genes, but we are certainly modifying the phenotypic expression of their genes into a certain profile that is more associated with uh, adverse function. So I, I think this is a, a really dramatic illustration of what we were discussing at the TLC. And, and then to just follow this up a little bit, uh, this maybe looks a little more confusing, but what, what is being found is that when, uh, when we eat, uh, depending on whatever that is that we eat, we're influencing in real time the expression of genes that are associated with the specific types of metabolic function. And this, this paper that appeared uh, in the September issue of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, I think is a, a good illustration of that. Um, of, in the lower right, I've included these, uh, this gene map network. This is a Barabasi's type of uh, presentation. And you'll notice that uh, you'll see all these various genes with, with abbreviated names uh, the, the size of the circles around these genes has to do with their uh, relative association, the so-called z-score, <clears throat> to specific functions. And it shows how these are interconnected as network hubs to all these other genes. So they're working as families that are all modulated as a consequence of eating certain foods. And the conclusion of this was healthier diet was associated with genes involved in metabolic function. Uh, and based on this, a healthy diet then leads to gene regulation by modulating those genes that are associated with metabolism that's associated with a functional healthy outcome. And over here on the left is the kind of the gene map uh, uh, correlation diagram that shows the, the p-value, the level of, of uh, statistical significance of the association between these families of genes and their SNPs and dietary uh, uh, intake, and you'll notice that these have very <laughs> high uh, degrees of uh, correlation, uh, 10 to the minus 6. I mean, that's like a lot of uh, zeros to the right of, of, of the decimal point. So these are really, again, demonstrating that there are these families of genes that are interrelated in their expression to the way we eat, which then uh, couple together to produce relative functional outcome. And it's interesting, isn't it? These are um, uh, data that was coming from the uh, Framingham Heart Study, uh, up to third generation participants, <laughs> which we start getting the passing on of cer certain genetic information from generation to generation that relates to their dietary uh, sensitivity. So if I could just kind of summarize what I've tried to say is that in our TLC, I think we were, we were exposed to some extraordinarily important takeaway information. When uh, uh, Horvath, Steve Horvath uh, uh, talked about the, the methylation of our genome and the relationship to a bat to what he called our grim age, you might recall that uh, uh, as we get older, our uh, genome gets more methylated, you know, methylated as a consequence, not that we eat too much folic acid in our diet, but to the fact that processes that lead to uh, uh, epigenetic modulation of our genome occurs through things like uh, inflammatory response and toxins in the environment and things that lead to epigenetic remodeling of our genome and that that be, can be correlated with our chronologic age but also our biological age and that's why he called it grim age because yes there is a correlation between methylation patterns as we age in our numbers of birthdays but we find many uh, cases where people are younger who have a grim age that's much older and uh, other individuals that are older who have a grim age that's much younger based upon alteration of these methylation regions uh, due to how their genes were exposed to their experience called life. And so we're starting to develop a 
genetic molecular way of actually tracking these things, which is opening all sorts of doors that we'll hear more about in, in our subsequent uh, uh, meetings about how to use epigenetic uh, profiling, not just telomere length, uh, but epigenetic profiling to actually start to understand the plasticity of how our genetic messages are being expressed uh, into our phenotype with differing uh, lifestyles. And you recall Horvath did uh, talk about the study that he was one of the co-collaborators in that was recently published on the use of metformin and human growth uh, hormone and, um, and uh, uh, ACE inhibitor medications to modulate grim age. Now I would suggest that if you think about the functions of each of those medications, uh, those uh, functions are modulating insulin signaling, modulating uh, what we would call cell renewal genes that have to do with mTOR pathways and energy economy. So you don't need a human growth hormone to uh, influence these pathways that lifestyle and exercise and diet can do that. And certainly with regard to blood pressure and, and uh, uh, the effects that uh, these uh, ACE inhibitors have uh, can be modulated again through diet and lifestyle factors. So the, the reflection that I took away from Steve Horvath was uh, we're developing new tools based upon uh, methylation of the genome, particularly lymphocytes, where we can, you know, get the Buffy code of, of our white cells and analyze the methylation patterns, which change rapidly because the blood cells are turning over rapidly. So we're measuring indirectly hemopoietic uh, influence of our diet and lifestyle on, on our function and how our genes are regulated and that we can modulate in our diet uh, in, in ways that are consistent with individual need and start to uh, look at the effects that that has on, on our methylation patterns. These are extraordinary new tools that are emerging. And then we can just go right to the, uh, what we can do today as was, uh, was discussed, uh, utilizing uh, continuous blood sugar monitoring or tools that are available today as uh, Molly Maloof talked about, I think, very, very nicely about uh, the use of continuous blood sugar monitoring. Or, or uh, we also had a new bit of information that I thought was quite, uh, quite interesting from Lee Siegel was talking about the work that's uh, on, on been done at the Weissman on the use of this microbiome uh, shotgun genomic or metagenomic analysis to interrogate how a person is going to respond in their diet, to, uh, glycemic response to specific foods based upon the microbiome. So without even putting a continuous glucose monitor on a person, we can start to understand something about how their own individual diet and foods that they select would influence their blood sugar based upon this, uh, this microbiome uh, metagenomic analysis. So these are all frontier things that are really changing the field uh, dramatically and giving us precision uh, and tools that will allow us to individualized uh, how nutrition is going to be in, uh, deployed and, and utilized. And it, uh, if you then couple that together with uh, the emergence of smart devices and wearables, and you probably know just within the last uh, few months now, uh, at least four companies have come out with wearable devices that do continuous blood, uh, blood pressure monitoring that are um, risk uh, related blood pressure. And so now we have a new another tool we can add to our arsenal uh, to start to evaluate functional influences at the phenotypic level uh, of uh, individual changes that we make in lifestyle and diet. So the, the list of uh, things, not just the uh, uh, Apple Watch with its uh, cardiac rhythm uh, capabilities, but now blood pressure and soon we'll have non-invasive uh, blood sugar monitoring, continuous blood sugar monitoring that won't even require penetrating the skin. All of these tools are opening up uh, a new age of, of how this information is going to lead to more precise uh, nutrition intervention. So let me, let me close by saying that one of the themes that we have been developing through the last few years of our PLMI uh, Thought Leader Consortia is to try to help us understand what's happening at the frontier of research or, or related to the most dynamic system that responds to, to changing uh, lifestyle and environment and diet. And, and that's the immune system. The immune system is, uh, is really where the action lies if you want to start to look at short-term influences of changes uh, that we make in our exposure levels. And we're getting into an era in which if you want to understand the immune system, you really want to understand aspects of the hematopoietic system 
that is responding to the environment because it's out of the bone marrow where the progenitor cells that lead to our ability to respond to our environment uh, is a, are originated. And some of you who have been coming to the previous uh, TLCs remember that I've, I, I've had individuals uh, present on what might have appeared as very esoteric topics at the time, like clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which we call CHIP, C-H-I-P. These are clonal mutational uh, changes in our white cells uh, that occur as a collection of mutational injuries that, that increase over age and have been found to be associated with uh, the risk of atherosclerosis and cancer, two very diverse diseases, but maybe they're all tied together at their origin through alteration of the immune system through in lifestyle and environmental changes that influence uh, the production of these uh, uh, DNA injuries and, and mutational changes that get clonally perpetuated and immortalized. So the question is, can you get rid of these once you find them? Can you rejuvenate the immune system? How, what, what, do, what do we know about immunonutrition? Can we, can we actually do something with this new information to use this not only as an assessment tool, uh, using the immune system in a different way, but also as a therapeutic tool for tracking uh, uh, intervention success? And uh, to just give you a prelude, uh, that is going to be the focus of our 2020 uh, Thought Leaders Consortium. I'm very excited to say that we pulled together a program that I think will take this uh, story that we've been evolving and take it to the next level. The, uh, uh, the title of our 2020 um, PLMI Thought Leaders Consortium is going to be Immune Rejuvenation, Senolinic Science and the Clinical Application of Personalized Lifestyle Medicine. Those of you who don't know what the word senolinic science means, you will. This has to do with the science of senescence or aging, which is all tied to immune uh, system function. And uh, we will be looking at immunonutrition, immunosenescence, uh, uh, the way that the body gets rid of uh, injuries within the immune system, which is called, uh, as you probably know, macroautophagy, how that relates then to behavioral sciences, medical nutrition, ecology, uh, this is going to be the focus of the 2020 uh, symposium or consortium, and I think it's going to be from the uh, presenters, the keynote presenters that we've outlined that will be carrying this message, uh, one of the most remarkable next steps forward in our advancing understanding of how to use precision in personalized lifestyle healthcare. So I hope you'll be with us. Uh, that's the October 9th and 10th, 2020. That's our uh, our meeting coming up, and it will once again, uh, thanks to popular response, it will be back again at the uh, Seattle Lake, uh, Washington Hyatt Regency, the same uh, facility that we had uh, this uh, 2019 meeting that seemed to be very well appreciated. So I'm giving you the first uh, first shot at, at the meeting. Uh, you'll hear much more about it, obviously, in terms of the program, but I can assure you this program is stacking up to be something like uh, very, very unique and very valuable. So. I want to thank those of you who are giving your time to uh, listen into this summary. I hope you took some value away from it. Uh, what I can say is that we are extraordinarily excited about the, uh, the leveraging and the translation of, of the things that are happening at the frontier of this new science of precision personalized lifestyle healthcare and moving it in through the functional medicine model of, of the operating system into clinical practice and translating and not waiting for 25 years for everybody to sign off on this before it actually provides value to its patients. So thanks a million. I really appreciate any of you who have given over your time to this uh, last hour, and I hope we'll, um, we'll see you in our 2020 uh, next uh, chapter, our seventh annual uh, Thought Leaders Consortium at the uh, Seattle uh, Lake uh, Washington Hyatt, October 9th and 10th. And with that, I'll sign off and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.